What's up beautiful people? Today we're taking a look at the policy of Indian removal and we're gonna take a close look at the Trail of Tears. First, some context about Indian removal. It is important when thinking about removal, you understand two things. Removal of native people from their ancestral land happened well before the Trail of Tears and removal was nearly always accompanied by Hold up. resistance. Remember way back in 1763, with the Treaty of Paris, France, France was kicked out of North America. This is important because many Native Americans lost their European trading partner, France, and the end of this war opened up a real possibility that American colonists would seek to settle west into Native American land. Pontiac's Rebellion put a temporary pause on that. Pontiac, an Ottawa chief, forged a Western Confederation and rebelled against colonists encroaching on their land. Remember, to crush this resistance, Britain said, additional troops to stop the rebellion and can't touch this as a result passed the proclamation act of 1763 fast forward a little bit to another treaty of paris in 1783 ending the american revolution america was free and the u.s acquired land all the way to the mississippi river once again native americans were not involved in the treaty negotiations even though it is native american land that is oftentimes being decided upon <laughs> The end of the American Revolution was good for hot dog and firework sales, but it was not good for most Native Americans. With the British gone, the proclamation of 1763 is bye-bye, and Native people no longer had protection from accelerating white settlement. As settlers moved westward during the 1780s, Congress enacted the Northwest Ordinances. Remember, under the Articles of Confederation, the Northwest Ordinances were a significant accomplishment, but... This will lead to a dramatic loss of land for various American Indian tribes. You could see how quickly the process unfolds from 1795 to 1809. Eventually, the Northwest Territory leads to the creation of five states joining the Union, but there will be resistance to this expansion to the West. Native tribes form the Northwest Confederacy under the Miami chief Little Turtle, which will lead to wars between the Miami Confederacy and the U.S. government in the 1790s. Unfortunately for Native Americans, the Battle of Fallen Timbers, Natives will be defeated by the U.S. Army led by General Anthony Wayne. The following year in 1795, the Treaty of Greenville will be signed in which the defeated tribes gave up claim to the Ohio Territory. And very important point, the Treaty of Greenville after the Battle of Fallen Timbers proclaimed most most of Northwest Territory as American. And the Treaty of Greenville basically gives the green light to a surge of new settlement in this region. Throughout the 1790s and early 1800s, America continued to expand its territory. Of course, in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, the United States goes from this to this as a result of the deal Jefferson made with Napoleon, nearly doubling the size of the United States. And we will see major conflict over this territory acquired during the Louisiana Purchase in the second half of the 19th century. But it's important to note, well before then, each Native American defeat cleared the way for more Western expansion. Now, a major part of this story is going to be the continued Native American resistance. While Native Americans lost the Battle of Fallen Timbers, there will be another resistance in the early 19th century from these two brothers. Excuse me. Tecumseh, who was a Shawnee warrior, and his brother, known as the Prophet, formed a union of tribes east of the Mississippi to try to fight white intrusion on their land. They are given weapons supplied by the British, and they lead a whole cultural revival amongst various Native American tribes. Tecumseh was able to unify many tribes in this region and defeated Americans in a number of battles, but unfortunately, this resistance is once again checked in the Battle of Tippecanoe when a guy by the name of William Henry Harrison, who will one day become president, organized the army and attacked native resistance in 1811 and won the Battle of Tippecanoe. This is a huge blow to native resistance and another win for American expansion. And in this early period, you're gonna see native land oftentimes being taken by war, treaty, and other means. We're gonna go from this in 1783 to roughly this by 1850. And we've seen some of these battles already. The Battle of Tippecanoe happened roughly right in this region. There's a battle known as the First Seminole War in 1816, no exact date. Andrew Jackson will lead soldiers into Spanish-controlled Florida and will kill a bunch of people, including Native Americans, during this First Seminole War. As a result, Spain, seeing that they are unable to defend or control the Florida Territory, will cede the region of Florida to the United States in the Adams-Onis Treaty of 1819. So this expansion is taking place at the expense of not only Native American people, but also European powers like Spain. Which leads us to our main event, the Indian Removal Act of 1830, and what happened to Native Americans in the American Southeast. 
In the southeastern part of the United States, there was a group of tribes known as the Five Civilized Tribes by the U.S. government. They were known as the Five Civilized Tribes because these tribes had assimilated or adopted elements of the dominant white American culture. The tribes included the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creek, the Chickasaw, and the Seminole. Examples of ways these tribes had assimilated to white culture include giving up their nomadic or semi-nomadic ways and setting up farms. Some adopted Christianity, some spoke English. Some married white Americans, and some even were involved in cotton production, and a few even owned slaves. Unfortunately, assimilation did not protect American Indians from increasing pressure to give up their land. Keep in mind, this area in particular is perfect for the expansion of cotton production. The only obstacles to opening up this land to southern farmers, many of them slaveholders, was the presence of these tribes. In 1828, gold was discovered on Cherokee land by some Americans, and this started a mini gold rush, and the state of Georgia began auctioning off Cherokee land to prospectors. Now, the Cherokee people did not sit quietly and allow this to happen without pushback, but rather go to war like Pontiac or Tecumseh, the Cherokee people led by... My name is... The chief of the Cherokee people was this handsome devil, John Ross, a man who was the son of a Cherokee mother and a Scottish farmer. Ross petitioned Congress to protect Cherokee land, and he did get some support from folks like Henry Clay and Daniel Webster, but the Jackson administration supported allowing the state of Georgia to proceed with imposing laws on the Cherokee people, and the federal government got involved in this takeover over of Native American land went in 1830 Congress passed and Andrew Jackson signed the Indian Removal Act. This allowed for the removal of tribes in this region to federal land west of the Mississippi River and at this point the Cherokee people realized they did not have enough support in the legislative branch in Congress. The executive branch was led by Andrew Jackson so they're definitely not going to get any help there. So your boy John Ross and the Cherokee people challenge the actions of the federal government through the U.S. courts. You can't get more assimilated than by suing the bastards. In 1831, the case of Cherokee Nation versus Georgia made its way to the Supreme Court. In the case, the Cherokee argued they were a sovereign nation, so therefore Georgia could not make laws in which they were required to follow. In the 1831 case, the John Marshall-led Supreme Court ruled that the Cherokee were a domestic dependent nation and therefore the court would not hear the case. However, the Cherokee Nation's luck would turn when one year later another case makes its way to the Supreme Court, Worcester versus Georgia. In Worcester versus Georgia, the Supreme Court sided with the Cherokee and said Georgia law does not apply to the Cherokee Nation. In other words, the Supreme Court ruled that the Cherokee Nation was a distinct community with self-government. This meant that the U.S. states could not impose their laws. Only the federal government could negotiate with American Indians, and if the U.S. government wanted the Cherokee to leave their land, the government had to negotiate a treaty with them. So Worcester versus Georgia was a huge victory for the Cherokee people. Nevertheless, <laughs> now we don't really know for certain if these words were in fact spoken by Andrew Jackson. There are conflicting accounts, but we do know the Supreme Court ruling in Worcester will have little impact on actually protecting Native American land. Jackson is alleged to have said, John Marshall has made his decision, now let him enforce it. And this is an important moment to remind you, court rulings, laws, and all that stuff are only as good as our commitment to enforcing them are. And Jackson had no interest in protecting the rights of the Cherokee people. The U.S. government began to pressure tribes to sign treaties accepting removal. Some tribes did, quote, voluntarily leave, figuring the writing was on the wall and it was pointless to resist. And in 1830, the Choctaw signed a treaty with the U.S. government and became the first Native American tribe to be removed. The Seminole Indians in Florida chose a different tactic. Another one. We get a sequel. After the Seminole Indians refused to leave Florida, a brutal war took place between the U.S. military and the Seminole Native people, known as the Second Seminole. Seminole War. This war was one of the most dramatic examples of American Indian resistance. It would last a number of years and led to a large number of deaths on both sides. As for the Cherokee tribe, Talk to by 1835, the federal government had pressured a small number of Cherokee members to sign the Treaty of New Echota. The treaty traded all Cherokee land east of the Mississippi River for $5 million and an agreement to move west to Indian Territory, what is today Oklahoma. However, <coughs> the treaty was not supported by tribal leaders such as John Ross, and the folks that agreed to the deal did not have the authority to speak for all the Cherokee Nation. In fact, the Treaty of New Echota was rejected by the vast majority of Cherokee 
Yet, the U.S. government held the entire Cherokee Nation to the terms of the treaty, and it became the legal justification for the forced removal of the Cherokee people, and their removal will become what is known as the Trail of Tears. Ross lobbied the Senate not to ratify the Treaty of New Echota on the grounds that it was not negotiated by the legal representation of the Cherokee people, but sadly, the treaty was ratified in a very close vote, just passing by one darn vote. Martin Van Buren is now the president, and prior to the deadline, out of about 17,000 Cherokee individuals, only about 2,000 were, quote, voluntarily moved. The new president, Martin Van Buren, sent General Winfield Scott and the army to forcibly remove thousands of Cherokee people from their homes and force their relocation to Oklahoma. Held in camps as people were rounded up, provisions were scarce, and conditions were awful. In 1838, the army began to force the Cherokee West to Oklahoma Indian Territory, this is the event known as the Trail of Tears. Around 15,000 Cherokee Indians were forcibly marched more than 800 miles over 116 days. They crossed the states of Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas. And the march took place during an extremely cold winter. And it is estimated that at least 4,000 people died of malnourishment, exhaustion, and exposure to the elements. That is roughly nearly one out of every four Cherokee Indians would die during this horrific event, including the wife of John Ross. Now to make this story even more fascinating, some of the folks who signed the Treaty of New Echota illegally ended up getting assassinated over their role in signing over the rights of the Cherokee land without the tribe's authorization. Pretty wild. In the end, though, the Cherokee people were forcibly moved from their homeland. And this story is way more complicated than just Andrew Jackson. It involves the Supreme Court, resistance from people like John Ross and many others, and of course, implementation by the guy who looks like Wolverine's aging father. <laughs>